Maybe I'll just say a quick uh, welcoming, uh, introductory note, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming, it was a great turnout. Um, we're, uh, well, maybe I'll introduce myself. I'm Ryan Katrazine, I'm an assistant professor at the School of Political Studies upstairs. My colleagues are giggling away over I'm here. Sorry. Like, sorry. Um, uh, so I'm one of the coordinators of the uh, International Pol uh, Political Economy Network, IPEN, uh, along with uh, Jackie, Jackie Best here, and uh, uh, Randy Germain at Carleton, and Chris Huggins, who's unable to uh, make it today. But on behalf of the uh, International Political Economy Network, I wanted to welcome everyone to this uh, first event of the year, presentation by Dr. Kate Neville of the University of Toronto. Um, before Kate's talk, let me just remind folks about our next event, and I'm, I'm are you? Yes. <laughs> our next speaker is, is here, who I haven't yet, yet met, but nice to meet you. Uh, so I'm going <laughs> to pass this around um, in, in a second, but it's a, a presentation with Jennifer Allen, who's uh, doing her postdoc at Carleton University, uh, and she's here in the flesh right now. Uh, and she'll be talking about how we uh, value ecosystem services. Uh, so, finally, I just want to um, remind everyone that the best way to keep apprised of uh, IPEN events and future IPEN events, uh, because there are others after, uh, after uh, these two talks, um, is to sign up through the, for the SIPS newsletter, so that's the uh, Center for International Policy Studies, and they have, um, through their website you can sign up for information through the newsletter. So, let me just uh, quickly introduce Kate. As you know, uh, she's uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, based in both, uh, housed in the uh, Department of Political Science and the School of Environment. Um, and her research investigates the intersection of global markets and local places with a focus on natural resources and energy, and it's uh, quite evident. Um, so through examining the global rush for biofuels and the so-called shale gas revolution, among other contested resources, uh, her work brings together political economy and social movement scholarship to better understand how these commodities and technologies link local communities uh, and ecosystems with global uh, institutions and networks. So without further ado, uh, here from Kate. Great. Thanks, Ryan. And thank you all. What a vibrant network you have here. I was looking beforehand at who's in Ottawa and just finding wonderful work that I'm drawing on. So it's a delight to be able to be here with you. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak, Ryan. And I'm also grateful to be here as a guest on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin people. So today, I would like to share some work from a recent project that I've been working on. And in fact, this is a fairly new area of inquiry for me, the area of investors and investor activism. But it builds on and it speaks to some work that I've been doing as part of a larger project on hydraulic fracturing. And that work has been largely in collaboration with Erica Weinfall at Duke University, with whom I did my postdoctoral fellowship. And the particular paper that I'll share with you today is a new paper that's under its sort of final set of reviews at the Review of International Political Economy. And it's co-authored with Jackie Cook, who runs a consulting firm and is very immersed in the world of shareholder activism in practice as well as in theory with Erica Weinfeld, Jennifer Baca at the University of Pennsylvania, and Karen Backer at UBC. So we've been doing this collaborative work, trying to unpack some of the dynamics in the financial sector related to hydraulic fracturing that speaks to some of the on-the-ground social movements we've been studying and witnessing in very local places. So the way Ryan described my work, and that was the biography I gave him, was this sort of intersection of finance and local places the local places will be a little bit lost in this particular presentation. They're not the focus. Really, it's that intersection of the activist world with the financial sector. So how do we think about that realm? Um, so I'm keen to share this because we're hoping to do a bit of follow-up work, some ongoing work. And I was speaking with Graham and Jen uh, a little bit before this presentation, thinking the world of network analysis is one I'm quite new to, so I'll be keen to hear some advice on that at the end for those of you who can stay. So in October of 2017, four protesters chained themselves to a Bank of America entrance in Seattle. Many of you might have seen this news. Uh, they walked movement in and out of the bank, chained themselves to these entrances. That staged protest and very publicly covered protest was part of a wider set of demonstrations 
that took place over a three-day period in the city called Divest the Globe. Now, that was coordinated by an indigenous-led group of activists, a coalition in collaboration with climate activists, including the 350 branch uh, in Seattle. Their aim, the aim of the Divest the Globe campaign, was, in their words, to demand that banks stop financing repression of indigenous rights, human rights abuses, and desecration of the earth. And the campaign led to the Equator's Principal Association agreeing to review its principles. Um, and so the Equator Principles, for those of you who are less familiar, is a risk management framework uh, to address, assess, manage environmental and social risks in projects that are being financed by these various financial institutions that sign up. Now the Seattle protests illustrate this growing movement that we're seeing within environmental and climate activism to direct activist claims to corporations and to financial institutions. This is not a new tactic. This is familiar for quite a long stretch of time. We can go back and find examples. But as the global reach of corporations and of global trade and the role of private actors in environmental governance increases, we start to see these claims take on new significance. And we also see this becoming more important in an era of networked activism and brand marketing where actions are publicly visible in terms of these demands to financial institutions, even as the financial relations themselves become more obscure and difficult to track. So that's, that's a fairly uh, obvious non-state actor demanding things of the financial institutions. But our questions turn then to thinking about that corporate governance from within, those financial institutions not as monolithic structures to whom activists outside make demands, but also what is happening within the context of those organizations themselves. So the bank protest is one angle on environmental demands, but we see that fragmentation within the private sector offering possibilities for new ways of understanding corporate governance and the changes that we're seeing in corporate governance practices. So the rise of risk management, risk disclosure, corporate social responsibilities, themes that lots of you write about in your own work, uh, represent new commitments from corporations to address environmental and social risks as part of their core business models. So they've incorporated in the ways that corporations account for their own financial activities. And these changes are a complex, uh, sort of the result of this complex interplay between government regulations that are emerging, these demands from civil society actors on the outside, and their own investors, their own financial actors. So the work that I'm presenting, this paper that we've written, emerges from those questions about that internal contestation. And we're curious about who the actors are that are challenging corporate governance from within, what the tools are that are available to them, how these actors make strategic decisions about the target and the nature of their claims, what constraints are they facing, and how are they strategically acting within the limits set uh, by various financial institutions or regulators. And then ultimately, although our paper maybe doesn't spell this out as fully as uh, the field might like, what impact do those demands have on corporate practice and outcomes? And we have to speculate a little bit more about that from our data, but, but these are the suggestive kinds of questions. This is where we're aiming at this work. How do we start to link financial changes to corporate outcomes, to energy governance, environmental governance more broadly? So I want to tell you a little bit about where this fits in that larger project on fracking to give a sense of where this set of questions emerged from, particularly because we focus on a very narrow set of tools that financial activists are using from within corporations. But I want to place that in the context of the bigger set of questions. So the work on shareholder resolutions is really part of a project on the intersection of environmental action, activism, and the private sector um, in environment, sorry, so the activism, environmental, social movement component, and corporate governance of energy and extractives. And most of my work has looked at these fairly separately. I've led some work on, with Erica on hydraulic fracturing debates in the Yukon, um, and land use planning and conservation, looking at the ways in which communities raise their voices, operate in conjunction, operate strategically to make claims on companies or governments that are coordinating hydraulic fracturing plans. I've also led by scholars at Duke, um, Erica and some of her PhD students, 
worked on things like the industry structure of fracking in North Dakota, so how corporate structure is playing out in local communities in terms of revenue, uh, sharing agreements with communities or taxation demands, various forms of industry structure. And with Jen Baca leading this project, looking at congressional hearings in the United States, looking at the regulatory dimension and industry uh, participation in the congressional hearings that are shaping US federal hydraulic fracturing regulations for the lack thereof. So those are fairly separate angles, looking very much at the corporate angle or the corporate state relationship and looking at the community as the center point of this work. So this project really takes that intersection and says, what about the activists or advocates or agitators of whatever sort of title we might give them within companies demanding change from the companies that are engaged in those very practices? So that's the, the logic of where this particular project came from. And I want to put this into a broader set of literatures that many of you know and that inform the questions and the approaches that we're taking. So in 2014, and again in 2016, in this letter from 2017, several collectives of investors made the news. And they made the news with written demands to the US first, and then the US and Canadian governments, asking for increased regulation of methane. So methane, for us, is connected intimately to hydraulic fracturing, given that's one of the big concerns about natural gas. Shareholders, collectives of shareholders, were expressing their concern about the financial risks associated with methane and climate change and calling on government regulators to take action. So such a move when other actors in the fossil fuel industry were actively resisting federal regulation reveals that fragmented nature of the private sector. Here we have a very clear demonstration of those splits within the investment world, within the financial world. It also reveals the shifting understanding of environmental degradation as a material risk for investors, something that ought to be taken into account for financial reasons, not just the social or environmental ethics that individual or corporations, uh, players, managers might hold. And so this is one of the mechanisms. Again, this is sort of that interplay of external government regulation, investor-state relationships. But while investors can certainly take these actions, asking regulators, it's unusual, but we're seeing it, many of the strategies that investors hold for making change in corporations comes from tools they hold within those companies themselves. So beyond turning to government regulations, um, and we, we're watching this simultaneous and complementary set of activist strategies, that's sort of part of the landscape of the project. We're focusing on this paper, on the push for changes to corporate governance from within, looking at the tools of shareholder resolutions as a way of making claims on companies. A very public, very traceable form of written um, claim making on corporations. So filing shareholder resolutions, for those of you less familiar with that process, uh, is a process in which investors submit written proposals for consideration and potential voting by shareholders, by other shareholders in the company, at annual general meetings. Of course, this is restricted to publicly held companies with investors. This doesn't apply to the private, non-stock market listed companies. Resolutions have to follow very strict guidelines. So in the US, it's a process regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. And the regulations include restrictions on the types of demands that can be made, the holdings that shareholders have to have and the length of time that they've held those holdings, the format, and very clearly the language of proposals. They're limited in length, they're limited in the types of claims that can be made, and those are all monitored and assessed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Resolutions can address all sorts of issues, not only environmental and social issues, a whole range of governance concerns within corporations. And several hundred socially and environmentally focused resolutions are filed annually in the US. I think that the range, there's somewhere around uh, 3,200 shareholder resolutions in general that have been filed from 2011 to 2016. So that works out to somewhere around six or 700 shareholder resolutions a year in the US, of which a couple hundred are environmentally and socially focused. So there's a whole other breadth of shareholder resolutions being filed, but our focus here is on these environmental and social 
resolutions. Resolutions are usually, although not exclusively, <coughs> non-binding or precatory. So they don't hold legal heft. They're suggestive, but even if shareholders agree to them, even if the majority passes that shareholder vote, companies are not legally bound for most of them to take those actions. So that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind about this set of tools. The filing of social and environmental resolutions has increased over time. It's still not a huge number. These are in the hundreds, not the thousands. Um, in 1988, 215 socially and environmentally focused resolutions were filed. Um, in 2014, about double that. So we're seeing an increase from the late 80s to now, but you can still see that, that range, the subset of these kinds of demands, this particular set of tools. And resolutions can either go to a vote or they can be withdrawn before the vote. And so that'll be an important piece to keep in mind about the structure of these particular shareholder tools. So the core questions that we asked in focusing on these shareholder resolutions, these tightly regulated and closely monitored forms of claim making in the corporate landscape, um, allowed us to ask these bigger questions about investor power in corporations, both within specific companies and in the industrial sector more widely. So although we were looking at a set of claims made to specific corporations through these resolutions, our focus was really more on the strategies of coordinated investor action, a set, a suite of claims being made to companies and to the sector, not just the specific mechanics of individual investor actions. So we asked what power investors have to shape corporate practices, <coughs> how investors in individual companies leverage their influence across firms, and what role financial actors play in energy governance more broadly. That was really the question at the heart of this paper. And the paper fits into a set of papers um, in a special issue proposed to RIPE. It asks about energy governance and political economy, about that intersection where new forms of analysis are seen to be needed by a lot of environmental scholars and asking what the political economy literature can bring to that understanding. So I wanted to run through the frames that the sort of theories that we're building on, the literatures that we're looking to. And we're building on this robust and expanding work on investor-led governance. So we situate our work within the landscape of changing commodity chains and changing global finance, and really looking at um, an understanding of the changing nature of those nodes in the commodity chain and what that means for where power is situated among different actors. So in particular, scholarship on that political economy of commodity chains has tracked the changing nature of production systems themselves and pointed to three intersecting trends. And so the first is this idea of growing distance between the nodes in the production chain, between where production is happening, where manufacturing is happening, retailing, consumption, and that realm of finance. So these elongating chains that are crisscrossing the globe in new ways. There's lots of work in global environmental politics. Many of you here work in that very centrally. So we see things like flexible spe specialization or transnational production processes contributing to that distance. Concurrently, we see a shift of power, and it's been argued that it's moving both upstream and downstream in commodity chains. And we're particularly interested in the upstream angle, so where power moves to corporations and to their financers, to various forms <coughs> of investment in that chain. And we see that second trend in part as a result of this third trend of financialization. Now, recognizing that financialization is used somewhat differently by different scholars, we, we situate this as a new form um, or a changing form or an increasing form of private governance that involves abstracting financial decisions from the physical goods that underpin them. And so it opens up that space. We use it quite broadly because we'd like to, we are drawing in our paper on quite a few different angles of the literature on this question of how we think about that abstraction and what space that opens up for financial actors. So we see this too as something that doesn't erase the connection between those physical goods and the finance, but something that obscures it, that makes those much harder to track, much more complex, um, much less visible, particularly, uh, or even to, I should say, the actors within the private realm. 
So research is emerging on investor-led governance, these changes in private governance that are coming from the private sector itself, from investors, from corporate management boards, the various range of actors. In the context of environmental governance, much of this work has been on carbon and climate change. And so we draw on this work, but our work expands that somewhat, asking about a suite of energy technologies and products related to hydraulic fracturing that have to do not just with carbon and climate, but also with environmental health, with social uh, and environmental concerns from a broader perspective. So a lot of the concerns that come up in the resolutions that we are looking at, which I'll get into in more detail, are not focused exclusively on climate. There are a wider suite. And this is important to our analysis <coughs> in terms of our contribution to the literature on investor-led governance. So thinking lots of the insights that are coming out of the carbon climate world are in fact very relevant to other forms of environmental governance, other commodity sectors. So quick note before we go for those of you who are less familiar with the core technology uh, extractive practice that this paper is focusing on, that my work focuses on. So most of you are probably familiar with the term fracking, to varying degrees familiar with that technology. Hydraulic fracturing is a technology to extract oil and gas from tight rock formations. So particularly shale, that's been the main one, there are other tight rock formations. Fracturing itself is a small part of the extractive process, but the term is often used loosely to describe the entire realm of activities associated with unconventional oil and gas. It's a catch-all word. I will use it for the rest of this presentation, but I use it uh, wanting you to know that there are political controversies associated with that term, and that the industry itself uses a much more narrow definition. So these are important to remember too in the social production of these resolutions, what it is that's being demanded of companies and how they respond. So fra the fracturing process itself involves high pressure injection of fluid, water, and sand, fluids, water, sand, and chemicals rather, uh, into these tight rock formations. It's combined with another set of technological advances in oil and gas production called horizontal drilling. So rather than just drilling a vertical well, which is a typical conventional practice, these wells go vertically and then horizontally, allowing much greater access to wide swaths of land underground. For oil and gas that is not pooled like conventional oil and gas, but trapped in these tight rock formations in the shale, this is an important feature for being able to access enough of a resource to make that drilling worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So that high pressure injection of frac fluid, that sand water chemical mix, is shot vertically and then horizontally through a series of high pressure injections, sometimes matched with little explosive devices, though not always. The rock itself is fractured and can be, uh, can flow up through the well and um, brought to refinery and um, markets. So that sort of process, that fracking term now we might think includes the fracturing itself, the extraction, the produced wastewater, the wastewater treatment and disposal, chemical mixing that happens beforehand, that whole range of activities. This has been, as most of you know, it's hard to not have heard this, the public controversy has proliferated. So we've seen a barrage of bans and moratoria around the world in small communities, uh, court cases, a, huge, a lot of public inquiries, various governments launching panels to decide whether or not to allow hydraulic fracturing to take place, grants just banned fracking, lots of political and social response. And so the reason that I point out all of the different pieces is not just to better understand this technology, but to understand why this is not just a climate and carbon matter. So lots of the concerns that come up around fracking have to do with the social implications of new wells <coughs> in places that haven't experienced oil and gas production. Noise, road building, drilling, seismic line testing, the whole suite of extractive practices that go with the fracking. It also has led to, and perhaps the most notable of the concerns, is water contamination. So that's a, a whole function of 
the chemical mixing that happens before the fracking process, the produced water that's brought back up, the water footprint of the amount of water that's needed for fractures, lots of uh, varying scientific literature coming out on the impact in different places that actually is very, very variable. So in some places, a huge water footprint in others, less so in comparison to other oil and gas extraction practices, but certainly something of large social concern. And lots of spills at the surface. So most of the contamination that's been associated with hydraulic fracturing has been found not to be in the underground aquifers, which was the initial big worry, but in fact, a lot of surface water contamination from the whole suite of initial and post-production wastewater issues, chemical um, water mixing questions. So lots of surface water contamination in lots of places. And then seismic activity has been another area of concern. So a whole suite of concerns that are in addition to the methane and climate and dependence on fossil fuels or energy concerns. So we see a, a large suite of actors coming together trying to address hydraulic fracturing, and that's also true within the investment world. So we'll see that in the resolutions that I look at. So we focus our analysis on investor attention to hydraulic fracturing in the US. The US is the epicenter of shale production. There is commercial scale hydraulic fracturing in Canada. Some is emerging in China but the global center of hydraulic fracturing of shale gas production is in the US. So we focus our attention there. There's also a really good suite of uh, resolution data available for US companies. Um, so we've used a set of databases, the Investor Environmental Health Network series. They're both coalitions of socially responsible investors and uh, nonprofit organizations that come together uh, around environmental and social concerns. The, environmental, the, inter the Investor Environmental Health Network is particularly focused on environmental health. Its concern is not the same climate goals as series, so slightly different angles, but they've both been tracking these resolutions. And then Cook ESG, one of my co-authors, Jackie Cook, has been working on this as well. We choose the time period 2010 to 2016 to look at, and the 2010 starting period was because in 2009, the Investor Environmental Health Network launched an investor campaign to file shareholder resolutions around hydraulic fracturing. And it brought together several socially responsible investment firms, um, as well as other nonprofits, as you saw was another nonprofit that joined in to launch this series of campaigns. So we have from uh, no particular resolutions filed on hydraulic fracturing, a surge in 2010, in the 2010 filing season. And so we start our time point there, and then we go to 2016, that was when we uh, started writing the paper, so we stopped our data analysis. There have been some resolutions filed in 2017 and now in 2018 on fracking, although not as many. And in part, we make an argument later in our paper about the choice of activist strategies around which issues they target when, um, but I'll leave that for the moment. So we found 54 resolutions during our time period that were filed around hydraulic fracturing. And to give you a sense of the data, so of those 54, 28 of them went to vote, were published on the proxy ballots for companies at their annual general meetings. The other 26 were withdrawn. Now this is a typical uh, experience in shareholder resolution filing, lots of resolutions are withdrawn before they're <coughs> actually taken to a vote. And that's often a function of dialogue between resolution filers and the companies. Sometimes that is the goal of the companies, but not, or of the filers, although not always. So there's a bit of a strategic question <coughs> about companies' responses, which we'll talk about. The corporate targets themselves, there were 26 companies targeted, and of the ones that went to vote, the 28 that went to vote, 15 companies were targeted. So this is over that 2010 to 2016 period, so several companies were targeted in more than one year. They were filed by 17 institutional and one individual shareholder. So institutional uh, investors, will we'll look at them in a moment. The institutional filers were members of at least 13 different shareholder resolution, sorry, socially responsible investing networks. Um, so that includes 
IDHN and series, these kind of networks of shareholders sharing these particular environmental or social values. And most were involved in multiple networks, so most were members of multiple networks of socially engaged investors. That looks like um, various UN-associated organizations, the PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investing, or the financial, uh, I've lost the, the name, the UNFFI. Forgotten the, yeah, I remember. But various, various networks of investors that come together to establish principles for corporate behavior that then have participated in these filing actions. So again, only shareholders who have certain stakes in a company for certain amounts of time can file these resolutions at a given company, but they can participate in these networks to help them form those choices, form those strategies. Um, and that's a, a key part of the analysis that we've done. So the investors themselves who have filed uh, claims against companies include not-for-profit foundations themselves, the Park Foundation and As You Sow, which actually have holdings in companies. It includes various sort of socially responsible investing firms, Trillium Asset Management, Green Century, ones that have staked their business reputation as investing firms on particular principles. Various mutual funds, faith-based organizations, and interestingly, huge pension funds. Now, the New York City Pension Fund in New York State Common Retirement Fund are among the largest, I think they're among the three, three or four largest pension funds in the US, public pension funds in the US. They've also made the news, I think in the last two weeks, because they, the uh, controller of the New York State Pension Fund is part of launching a lawsuit against companies on climate change grounds. So there's lots of activity going on in these organizations. The individual, it's not quite as strange as it might look. Uh, Patricia Carr Seabrook is actually um, a major player in the socially responsible investing world. She, uh, I can't remember which firm she's at at the moment, but she's, she's part of one of the firms that also filed uh, one as, as a socially responsible investing firm. The target companies, and this to us also was, was interesting because it fit very nicely with a lot of the theories put forward and a lot of the evidence in other areas of uh, shareholder resolution scholarship, which is these are large firms in the sector that are being targeted. Um, the targets, among the 26 targeted companies, 18 of them were listed in the top 40 US natural gas producers in 2015, and 19 of them in the top 40 for 2016. So including the top four in both 2015 and 2016. These were the top four US natural gas producers in 2015 and 2016. And that's ExxonMobil, Chesapeake Energy, Anadarko, Petroleum, and Southwestern Energy. So ExxonMobil is known by all. The other three are more known in the natural gas sector, Chesapeake was one of the major players in developing hydraulic factoring technologies. Um, this is significant in terms of the amount of natural gas produced. The, there were over 14,000 oil and gas companies in 2009 in the US, but the top 10 produced a third of the gas. So it's not a very spread out kind of sector. There are lots of small companies producing lots of small amounts, but the top producers are producing a huge amount of the US's natural gas. So the vote share, so those 28 resolutions that were taken to vote, um, none of them garnered majority support. The closest was in 2011, Energen got nearly 50%. So 49% was the top. But in that period of time, only two didn't hit a 20% threshold and over half of them had more than 30% of the vote share. So this is among the voting shareholders at the annual general meetings. Most of them had at least a fifth of their investors in support. And lots of them had nearly a third, or just over a third. So the vote shares, the vote shares are not in this period of study a resounding success. Right, not hitting 
percent doesn't sound like a great outcome. But that's only if we go by majority votes as a sign of effectiveness, which the literature, literature on shareholder resolutions tells us we ought to be a little bit skeptical about that as being the metric. So remembering these resolutions are generally not binding anyway. They're not legally binding. So a 50% benchmark doesn't actually mean a company would be legally bound to most of these decisions, even if they passed. And so for a corporate management board who looks at a fifth or a third of their investors asking for a particular course of action, that's not something to ignore. This is particularly the case because what we know about shareholders is most of them are conservative, many of them are passive. They tend to follow these large institutional investors that are not based out of socially responsible investing firms, tend to follow <coughs> corporate management advice. And so to buck that, to vote against corporate management, <coughs> to ask them to do these particular kinds of things around hydraulic fracturing is a significant outcome. So we start to see, particularly if we take a social movement's lens, something that's not just about a vote share, and start to think about the momentum that is building within corporations for particular kinds of actions, this starts to seem more significant. So one of the things we were interested in was what kind of strategies these shareholders used to file. So what were they doing? How are they bringing them forward? And what does this tell us about the kind of power that these might have, the kinds of opportunities that are opened up by this changing nature of corporate power for investors? So we found that there are several strategies that are used. One of them was going back to this idea of the networks that these shareholders are involved in. Investors are participating in these socially responsible investing networks, and so we did. We looked at all of the different filers and looked at which principles, which groups they had signed up to. And we found that most of them were participants in at least one. One was a participant, one of the filers was a participant in 10 different socially responsible investing networks. And lots were overlapping. Lots of these filers were engaged in the same networks, whether series, whether IEHN, or some of these other um, organizations. In this, we found that they were using model resolutions. They were using very shared language in the claims that were made. When we went and looked at the resolution asks, what the filing requests were demanding or requesting of the corporations, the language was nearly identical in lots of the cases. So we actually found that there were four main types of asks. Uh, of the 54 resolutions that we analyzed, so that includes the ones that were withdrawn as well as the ones that went to vote, 44 were modeled on four main types of requests. <laughs> Half of them were asking for disclosure of general hazards to air, water, and soil. So a disclosure request around some general environmental concerns. A quarter of them were asking for companies to develop strategies above and beyond government policy to address adverse environmental and community impacts. So going beyond what was already demanded by government regulation, although a fairly broad kind of request. Another quarter almost, we're asking for disclosure of risks to finance and operations from community concerns and regulatory impacts. So looking ahead and saying if communities are worried, if governments might put in more regulations, what are the associated financial risks or operation risks? And a handful asked for the development of qualitative and quantitative measures to address community and environmental risk. By forwarding similar demands to corporations operating in the fracking realm, shareholders can push the entire sector towards harmonized reporting and government's requirements. It's a possibility. If they're not going through, it's not clear that the companies will do this. But part of that coordinated goal is beyond just an individual company ask and pushes the entire landscape of fracking companies towards a certain set of common reporting requirements or disclosure requirements or risk requirements. That kind of strategic action enables smaller shareholders to benefit from their upstream position as investors by reducing the costs of filing shareholder resolutions, by reducing the amount of energy needed to do that filing work, if they can use language already in the format allowed by the SEC, already meeting those regulatory standards 
And these filings were not isolated to individual firms so, or to individual years. So many firms were being targeted in multiple years in iterative strategy. And many companies were targeted each year. So corporations were not only responding to their shareholders in a given year, but looking forward. If we don't respond this year, we might be the target again. And to other companies in their sector, even a company that wasn't targeted by its own shareholders was watching this sweep moving through the fracking sector of other investors asking other companies. And so thinking about the sort of social movement strategies of not just the actors asking for change, but corporations responding to those demands, we start to see a field-wide movement. And so this fits really nicely with some of the work on social movements in shareholder resolution actions. This is what other scholars have found as well. And we see this repeated in the fracking sector. But of course, and as Graham and I were chatting about before this presentation, companies themselves respond. These are not just claims made by activists, but there are counter movements that come back. And corporations are also strategic players. So there are two ways and two times where corporations can respond. One is before a resolution is published on a proxy ballot, so it's proposed by the shareholder filers, but companies have an opportunity to respond, and they respond through the SEC, and they respond in very particular ways. Their responses are also constrained. But there can be some informal dialogue that happens between the resolution filers and corporations that often leads to those resolutions being withdrawn. Nearly half of the fracking resolutions were withdrawn. Many of those explained by the SEC as corporate commitments. The nature of those commitments is not always public. That's a fairly vague uh, public explanation, but it suggests companies are making changes to try to avoid this going to a vote. Once the proxy, once that ballot is published, once investors are going to be allowed to vote on a shareholder filing, management boards still have an opportunity to respond in writing to all of their shareholders. So where they publish the vote to be made, the management boards also have a chance to advise their shareholders on how to vote. And so companies take advantage of this, and we coded the corporate responses to the fracking resolutions, and they fit into four main categories. Companies referred to reasons not to vote for the request being made because of existing company practices, they were already doing a good enough job, existing industry practices, the whole sector was doing a good enough job. The safety of fracking, we don't need more disclosures, risk disclosures, because this is not dangerous. And existing government regulation, we don't need to go above and beyond government regulation because it's adequate. So those were the kinds of responses that these companies were offering to explain to their shareholders why they ought not to vote in favor of these resolutions. So what all of this told us, where we went with all of these in-depth, nitty-gritty coding of management responses, shareholder uh, claims, what was being demanded. What we argue is that the upstreaming of power to investors enables environmentally oriented actors or financially concerned actors with concerns about environmental implications for their investments to participate in corporate and energy governance in new ways. For fracking, these resolutions provide a tool for coordinated claim making on oil and gas companies, and they bring attention to concerns over shale from within. The complexity of the financial system offers numerous channels for these institutional investors to engage in corporate practices. But the very same financial structures that enable shareholders to make these claims provide the limits on those claims. So, <coughs> The linking of corporate managerial rewards to shareholder returns, which has been a trend across the US and the UK, has magnified the power of investors, but at the same time has increased the power of management boards. And so SEC regulations that provide space for boards of directors to respond to these proposals are taken advantage of by companies, and many institutional investors pay attention to that. So the nature of these large institutional investors and their reliance on uh, proxy advisors and on management um, itself really leads to these being a tough tool to make large change quickly. Passive investors often represent very substantial corporate holdings 
So although this socially responsible investing sector is growing, still that balance of power within most sets of shareholders in these oil and gas firms is quite low. Because of that, some investors have decided divestment is a more effective strategy than shareholder resolutions trying to make this little change from within. So we see that tension as well. Do we just see a withdrawal of shareholders rather than the use of these particular corporate tools? The second piece is that financialization is moving power up the chain, but at the same time is obscuring power. So many investors don't know what they're invested in, uh, and mobilizing those actors is very difficult. Individuals who hold holdings in mutual funds or pension funds, many of us who are working in universities, lots of people in, say, the New York state system or New York city system who have pension funds, are not responsible for the decisions that their pension fund managers are making unless they take particular action and mobilize in very large ways. That's hard to do as an individual, even if your money is embedded in this system. So individuals with small holdings in large institutional investment Organizations are very difficult to mobilize and they have limited information about both their investments and probably the financial world itself. So they rely on their fund managers to make these decisions, which relies on a fund manager making a decision that this is indeed a financial concern, that this is part of their financial risks associated with those investments. And then the last part is that the changing nature of financial vehicles adds additional layers of complications to that one vote, one share balance. This has been true for some time. There are various share structures that come with votes and others that don't. It's becoming more common as hedge funds start to develop new derivative tools, new trading tools, new vote share borrowing tools in various kinds of companies. So that increasing complexity of that, of those financial vehicles themselves, is also changing the nature of these tools as a potential uh, strategy for enacting corporate change. We didn't observe very much of this in the data set that we had, but it's also hard to unpack that from a series of shareholder resolutions. How do you know which investors are um, borrowing which votes from which other holders of shares? That's a, that's a complex piece to uncover and is often very uh, invisible in the financial world. So we're starting to see that shifting the nature of power in investments more broadly, and that has an implication for these as tools moving forward. All that to say, those very same opportunities created by the trends that we're seeing in the political economy of investment and of energy commodities also creates those limits on the role of investors in executing that power for particular environmental or social goals. So the last one, hopefully I haven't gone too far over time. Oh. I'm going to skip the next pieces and we can talk about that in, in questions, sort of where we hope to go with this. But I wanted to put up this last photo as a symbol uh, for all of us and a reminder to myself. So this work is focused on very abstract and distant financial worlds, um, something that's often done in an abstracted way, this financialization that separates our uh, financial world and investments from the physical implications. But my work has always been inspired by and grounded in very physical places. So for hydraulic fracturing, caribou being affected by seismic lines and roads in the north is a strong reason that northern communities have been up in arms about this practice. And so I wanted to, to bring us back to the idea that understanding the dynamics of these investments, of these financial worlds, is a fascinating academic challenge, it's a fascinating financial challenge, but it also has these tangible, concrete outcomes for very specific places, ecosystems, and people. And so that's always worth coming back to at the end of something that takes us up into these kind of abstracted relationships. So thank you so much for the chance to share this work. Um, and I'd love to have questions and engage in discussion. I'll let you, because you have to leave early. Yes, so I'm going to, most likely to say, I'm going to send you some questions by email because I have to run. Um, but I wanted to thank you. I wanted, so when you get the questions from me, you'll know who I am. Um, so I teach in communication here, but my research is about Williston, North Dakota, which is where my family's from. So these, the, your picture of very tangible places, uh, I'll send you a, a link to my blog, and you'll see the, 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 the banner image is, it's an oil rig that is not on the land that my parents own. 
which is a significant story, but it's it's something that uh, uh, really resonated. So I, I just wanted to say, you'll be getting questions from me <laughs> about that. Is Kyle? It's Kyle, yep. Um, and I'll, I'll send you, uh, essentially I'm working on, on the impact of fracking in Williston, North Dakota, oh, okay. because it's it's where my parents live and it's where it's home. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, but then I, I had to run. So. Yeah. So if you please send me questions. Yes, so I will. Yes. The yeah. chancellor doesn't have a question formulated in the way you want to. Please, I I love exchanging on this, and this is still work in progress. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one question. Very interesting topic. Of course, I loved it. Um, I'm, I'm very curious about the method and how you get access to some of the information. So I'm guessing that we're all talking about public companies, so that helps. But then how did you get your hand on the resolutions themselves? What was the strategy that you've been using? Was this a very long, difficult road or it was already... Yeah. And, and can I just jump in here if you, before asking if you just introduced yourself? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, Marie-Josée Mascat, I'm here in political studies, and I've been working mostly on extract mining extraction in Latin America, working within the community, indigenous rural community mostly, to look at the socio-environmental impact. Oh, yeah, so I think, on oh, a side note on that, I think mining and fracking have a lot of analytical, a lot of analytical overlap in how we think about extractives, how we think about financial pieces and I haven't looked at mining but it strikes me there's a lot to learn from that literature. Um, the data itself, so because this is such a big area of investor-led activism, there's been a huge amount of tracking of this by the NGOs who are helping to coordinate them. So IEHN, the Investor Environmental Health Network, launched this campaign in 2009 among investors to do these filings on hydraulic fracturing and simultaneously kept a database of all of the resolutions <coughs> that were filed with the SEC. Now this is public data because to file a resolution with the SEC, this is automatically publicly held companies, so this information to them. There are regulations about how this is made public. So any that were thought about by filers and maybe discussed with corporations, we wouldn't track in this. So we don't know how many conversations happened before a resolution was actually written. But once a, an investor, a shareholder with that right, decided to submit to the Securities and Exchange Commission a potential resolution for consideration, that's automatically now public. There, you could search on... Public for shareholders or public? Public, public. For everyone. Public, public. Okay. Yeah. And so we could go to the SEC <coughs> database itself but rather than doing that, Ceres and IEHN have already done this okay. on a huge number, not just hydraulic fracturing. So for Ceres and IEHN, you can look on their websites and search for um, the various resolutions on climate or climate disclosure or climate and risk hydraulic fracturing or a series of other issue areas that they track. So we combined their databases because we wanted to make sure that we were capturing all of them and that they indeed had them right. And then Jackie Cook has been doing this as well. So my co-author has been doing this as part of her work separately. So we have this sort of cross-checked set of databases. And with that, you can see the resolution that they proposed. That includes the entire resolution language. We focused in on the ask component of the resolution, the part where they say, what they're asking, not all of the whereas, whereas, whereas sort of preamble text to those demands. Those were more corporate specific, um, but the actual asks ended up being just about identical with the name of the company switched out or the place of their operations hmm. switched out. And so that's, that was easy to access data and just involved um, some database coll sort of collation. And then we did a qualitative analysis. We did some tracking of of words, so we did a sort of same as search to see if the model resolution language matched. So how similar were these that we could see those same text phrases showing up in bright red, just about identically in 22 of the 54 resolutions that said just about the same thing. So we did that, and then the corporate responses are published publicly in their annual general meeting reports, which are also available. We, um, looked at the ones that they only respond 
with those to the voted upon. So if the votes were withdrawn, or if the filings were withdrawn, a corporation wouldn't have a publicly available statement. But if they went to a vote, they would. And that's, again, because they're publicly listed companies, that's all publicly available. Okay. Um, Jackie Best, um, also in the School of Political Studies. I was just curious, and, and you started perhaps answering a little bit when you were talking about how you didn't look at the preamble, but I'm wondering one place where you might be able to figure this out. But I was just curious how much you think, I, I, in the context of this, the, the method of this, this particular project that might not be possible to identify, but how much, I'm just curious how much of, of this kind of shareholder activism, whether it's possible to, to disaggregate how much of it is about uh, normative social concerns and environmental concerns, how much of it is about financial risk. And about you know the, and in, in you know about stranded assets and you know government regulation and it, when, in fracking it's linked to not just about local communities but also carbon you know constraints and so on. You think of all of the things that could could happen um, to the extent to which whether it's possible to sort of figure out that or whether you get interesting strategic dynamics where movements actually mobilize a language of financial risk or, but with a set of social goals and so on. And whether there's a sense of how that universe kind of because certainly in terms of your wider you know, the overlap, that, seemed, that becomes a really interesting question about how, you know, movements mobilize a set of arguments and claims and changes and in a world in which you've got these two different kinds, sets of value systems essentially operating. Yeah, so that, that was a, a misstep on my part to not say. One of the key pieces of these filings is they have to have a financial component. Hmm. So they don't have to frame it all in terms of everything just in financial words and but things about, okay. but there has a bottom the line. SEC, <laughs> the SEC yeah. uh, dictates whether or not a resolution is allowed to be put forward, and they have a certain set of constraints that mm. it has to involve some kind of um, financial yeah, yeah. consideration. So shareholders can't ask companies just to do things for the heck of for it. the good <laughs> of the world, right? Which, so, so shareholders. Which, which is important for shareholder filers, and it's important for thinking about who's going to vote in favor of these resolutions. Mm -hmm. So a shareholder filer that is part of a nonprofit that is particularly interested in changing social and environmental practice, who invests in a company in order to have a say from inside, or who invests in a company in order to give their employees a pension, um, but are fighting these fights in other ways. So the Park Foundation is a really good example of this. The Park Foundation filed, I think, four of the resolutions. In their other work, in their non-financial world work, they fund small community grants for, in part for communities fighting against fracking. So they're very clearly anti-fracking, they're very clearly community-oriented. In their filings, they had to abide by SEC standards and regulations. They wanted the SEC to rule that this was indeed a resolution that could go forward. And so they abided by those kinds of rules. What that meant was they weren't just trying to get on board shareholders in a company who care about the environment or who care about communities. They were trying to get all the investors on board because there are financial risks associated with ignoring those environmental or social risks. And so what that's led to is big institutional investors are actually starting to make changes. So BlackRock and Vanguard are two of the largest, BlackRock it might even be the largest asset holder in the world, asset manager in the world, with trillions of dollars of funds that they hold. They've recently incorporated into their management strategy concern about, about climate risk. That's not a function of BlackRock or Vanguard suddenly thinking, oh, we have to worry about climate change. This is a function of them thinking there are material risks, there are financial risks to investors from ignoring climate change. So the motivation for doing these shareholder filings is to frame it in that language of financial risk in order to potentially advance financial interests or social and environmental interests, and the filers don't always say. When we look back, I mean, I suspect that I suspect that Stringer is um, the, the manager of the New York State Pension Fund. I suspect he cares, I think it's Scott Stringer, cares very much about the environment. But what he says publicly is all about ensuring the good of all of the public employees, of the firefighters. That's his responsibility, the responsibility, police. yeah. He's probably not even allowed to let other things reduce the bottom line, in a sense, because that would be, yeah. Yeah, and what he's deemed is that climate and 
methane yeah, and social risks associated with these operations matters tremendously for those financial performances. Um, so that's an important piece of these resolutions as a strategy. And it's something that we do want to investigate a bit more in the next work, which I didn't talk about, but is this kind of network analysis of who's involved in these socially responsible investing networks. Which actors are they? Because boards, the board of As You Sow, which was one of the filers itself and not the profit foundation that does investing, on their board include former executives from the Rainforest Action Net Alliance, Rainforest Action Network, um, the Sierra Club, Friends of the Earth, and others. So there's a kind of movement from very clear non-governmental activist organizations fighting against certain environmental harms into the boards of groups that are working on financial activism. So what does that relationship look like? Those movements are not enough to draw our conclusions from, but we're interested in exploring those relationships a little bit more, that almost revolving door of investor activism and the not-for-profit world. Yeah. Um, Yelena Grass, I'm a visiting scholar at Colton right now. Um, thank you so much for this really interesting presentation. I have two questions. One is um, in relation to what we talked just before your presentation about with Graham, where um, uh, the, you make a really good point that large corporations are um, like great targets for any type of shareholder activism because they care about what their shareholders think. Um, but that does not only include environmental shareholder activism, right? And so I was wondering whether you looked at whether there was other types of um, shareholder requests at the same time. And especially since like, if you look at the news, we hear about like activist shareholders, it's more towards, like it frequently is individuals that are pushing corporations towards having higher quarterly earnings, right? Like more short term uh, changes and are influencing managers in that perspective. So is there like a back and forth in this realm between like more financial people and more environmental people or is it just uh, the entire push from shareholders are coming from uh, the environmental folks? And then my second question, maybe just, um, is, um, so I was looking at, so my work is on coffee, and there was an interesting shift um, as, like, within the mergers and acquisitions within the last 10 years towards more privatization and, like, public to private takeovers, where companies are actually taken off the stock market, uh, including due to increased SEC disclosure regulations, and there's discussion in the literature that it's actually now better for companies to just be private and then you don't have to care about any of these external influences in the first place. Do you see this happening in the Euro sector as well or are they just too big, like the companies are too big to be able to be just like taken private? Oh, such good questions. Um, okay, let me start with the second one first, mm -hmm. which is one of the, so the industry structure of the oil and gas sector, and in particular, those companies that are involved in hydraulic fracturing, is something that I've been looking at with Erica Weinthal. And one of her PhD students is leading a paper that I've participated in, trying to unpack that industry structure in North Dakota. And one of the trends that seems to be happening in fracking is very much the same trend that we saw in early, early oil and gas in the US which is initially small wildcatters, kind of one-off little private explorers were drilling for oil and gas, developing new technologies. As they got bigger, as they found resources that were really financially, economically viable, valuable, et cetera, in that financial kind of context in that, that price market, they would sell to bigger oil and gas interests. So they'd either end up amalgamating, selling off, and we've seen that happening in fracking. So Chesapeake, when it started, that huge oil and gas producer now, you know, one of the top four oil and gas producer, uh, natural gas producers in the US in 2015 and 2016, started off as a tiny company and ended up going public. And we see that being a trend in, in fracking. That it's very much like other patterns of oil and gas that it's Little companies can do that exploration work, but when it gets to be big processing, big transportation, pipelines to sort of do that, it, they usually sell to bigger players. So we've seen ExxonMobil coming in, not with the initial fracking technologies, not doing the one-off well explorations, but buying up interest once they're proven. So it's a little different, it seems, than the coffee sector. I haven't read very much that says that oil and gas 
companies would want to go private to avoid shareholder demands. That doesn't seem to be the trend in that sector. And I think that's a function of oil, the structure of oil and gas and the ways that it needs to end up going through pipelines or various kind of processing refinery sectors. So I, th I think that's a commodity specific kind of thing. On your first question, most of the resolutions that are filed are not environmental and social. Um, so going back, if we think that roughly there's six or 700, I don't, I'm not sure how even it is each year, but sort of 3,200 over a five year period. Um, well, of those, about 200 are environmental and social from the numbers that we were finding from various reporting sources, um, groups who, who track these, shareholder activist groups that track these resolutions. So most of the ones that are being put forward and most of the ones that get news are about other corporate governance issues. And so the big ones that have come out recently are control by shareholders for who's on the board of directors. So having some sort of shareholder say of who is managing the corporation. And that's not done, some of that has been picked up by climate activists to say that there need to be directors on the boards of directors who have climate expertise. But that's a very small sector of folks pushing for changes to boards of directors. The other one is say on pay, and that phrase is about executive compensation. And that's been a huge push. So most of the shareholder kind of news has been about executive compensation. We saw in 2012 in the UK a big kind of phrase that said it was the shareholder spring. It was after the Arab <laughs> spring, and there had a shareholder <laughs> spring in London. I'm not kidding you. This is big newspaper headlines. Um, it was essentially a whole group of shareholders across a number of companies in the UK were demanding changes to executive compensation. And we saw another kind of round of this in 2015 in France. So this is something not just in the US, but very globally. Shareholders asking for more control over the compensation of the executives of companies that they're invested in. And that has to do with shareholder returns most of the time. So if you pay your executives less, you potentially get more returns from their performance. All of that to say, mostly the resolutions that are filed are not environmentally and socially oriented, although it's not an insignificant number of the filed resolutions that are about those concerns. We did not, though, study individual companies and which resolutions were being filed against them in the same year. And I think that would be fascinating. It would be so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That it would be really interesting to track the SEC database for ExxonMobil and see what was being asked of them at the same time and what were the vote shares on those and were there any that were mm. in conflict. So I doubt that there would be ones that would say, let's reduce reporting on fracking because if ExxonMobil's already made these changes, they've decided it's worth it. And probably you're not gonna have a major counter push to that. But were there other demands that might make us think there's other pressures that are being responded to far more than? And what about those passive investors? Were they voting against corporate management on other issues? That would be a really good question. Yeah, we didn't think about that, but that would be a great, great thing to look at. Hi, um, I have two questions, one comment, one question. I'm Eleanor Boyce. I'm actually not in the academic world. I'm, I work at the American Embassy. Um, and I'm also an American, so, and I'm also a shareholder of, you know, whatever X, Y, and Z. But, what my comment is that whenever I'm asked, you get these things called proxies, and now it's great. You don't get them in paper; you get them over the internet. So you, <laughs> you know, you know, vote on for your, you know, vote for X, Y, and Z, and you go on, you click on. It's kind of interesting, and it says, and it'll have a whole page of stuff, and it'll be, you know, do you elect so and so to the board? And it always says, I think the word is. Um, management or the board recommends yes, recommends no. <laughs> and and I would think that when you're talking about resolutions, it would say, do you approve, you know, resolution X. It doesn't tell you what the resolution is. Um, so I can kind of see how shareholders might be, you know, completely lost, and it makes me feel really guilty that, you know, I haven't Googled resolution X to see if it's an environmentally uh, resolution. So, but it's kind of, you know, you just, they, they recommend what you vote for, and as a shareholder, you have absolutely no clue about, you know, whether Joe Smith or Susie Q should be on the board. So that's my, my sort of comment. Uh, but my second question is, about what's going on with Apple um, mm -hmm. and iPhones right now. And if I have it correct, 
you've got ma major shareholders who are pressuring the kind of the restructuring of the iPhone to put on parental controls mm -hmm. over the time. And how do you think that's going to, will that have a positive impact on, say, environmental uh, requests for comp in companies? I mean, will that just change the landscape? That's a great question. How do we think about the spillover of more aware shareholders? So if suddenly there are issues that shareholders might be concerned about in their personal lives, whereas fracking or something else seems very That's far. more esoteric than, you know, your kids and your, kids. And your iPhone. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's, but, the, but it's showing the power of these, you know, these major, uh, I guess they're private equity, that, you know, that they have on these companies. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a great example of places where we see the shifting power of shareholders in demanding changes to corporate practice. How much, I mean, and this is maybe a bigger question than just shareholder activism, but how much does observing activism or participating in feeling that you can change a system, whether it's corporate or government or the community around you, how much does that empower you to feel you could make changes in other areas you might care about? I think it's an open question. I'm not sure that that I, I would know how how that transfers, sort of does that individual empowerment to participate in these systems of governance spill over? And would that spill over for a shareholder who otherwise feels distant from their holdings? I mean, it might make you pay more attention to that company in general. Yeah. I could see that happening, that if you start to pay attention to where your money is and learn a little bit more about that, you might start to see other areas that conflict with the values you hold, or you might start to think about, are there other ways of investing those funds that I have? Are there other groups that are doing this? It could have that kind of effect. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that's maybe an open question for mm -hmm. others too here. I think it may, what it makes me think of is, is this question of whether there are at different times, like both in government context, but also certainly in social movement, certain styles of of governance practices and strategies that simply spread from one area to another. Um, I mean, my own work, which is it's only something that's just emerged, come up to me recently because I've been doing historical work on. On government, when in context in which governments use um, logics of exception and states of exception to respond, particularly to economic issues, but also political. And as I was looking back, I was interested in the present moment, and then looking back, and you see, you see a huge use. It was very popular in the 70s to declare a state of emergency. You know, <laughs> it's like that Trudeau did it. You know, the War Measures Act. But you know, you also had Nixon doing it for w wage and um, price controls. You had Heath doing it in the UK. You've got like this, and then all of a sudden it stops. And actually, Thatcher and Reagan don't do it, even though in fact Reagan has, and one of you know, one of his cabinet ministers urges him to do this and declare an economic Dunkirk, but they don't. I haven't yet figured out why. Like to me, that's an interesting puzzle, you know, why these things come and go. But in the activist context too, I'm thinking like it, it's, a, it's, it's a repertoire that you can draw on. One of my puzzles when I was in, in the UK in the was it early not, mid '90s or something was I, I noticed that an, animal rights activists were firebombing, like, and but if, and I, I was wondering using, and I was thought, well, maybe it's also because of the troubles, right? That in fact blowing things up had become part of. <laughs> Anyway, but you know, and I mean, it's a somewhat silly example, but that, 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 that certain forms of action and, and statements become more acceptable um, simply and, and move from one area to another. So I don't know, just to throw that on the table is like whether or not that, that, that this becomes, people start seeing it as a way of, uh, and then therefore start acting and using this new set of tools in a sense to, to, to exert pressure. I mean, we certainly see the divestment campaigns mm -hmm. borrowed from anti-apartheid, yeah. or borrowed from, I mean, this has been ongoing, yeah. but the surge of yeah. resolutions and divestment action was around anti-apartheid action mm. and then it's sort of grown in these other spheres. Mm. So the idea of having repertoires you can draw on, mm -hmm. I think, is relevant. So if you start to see success by other groups with one particular form, it might spread over. I do think that in the world of climate and environment, there's a real sense that these can only take you so far. So whereas you could easily think my problems as a parent around my kid having access to this phone could be solved by extra technological devices on it, that's something a corporation could do fairly readily that solves it with the environment, with fossil fuel concerns, with et cetera. There's only so far you can ask a fossil fuel company to go that stops it from being a fossil fuel company. So I think a lot of climate activists have really pushed the divestment mm. movement rather than shareholder activism. Mm. The asks that we saw in these resolutions were about disclosure, information, 
metrics to evaluate risk. They weren't about massive changes to practice. So I do think there's a difference in the kind of activist community and what they see the tools could do that might might limit how far we can go. And I think that's beyond just the limits of the financial system in shaping what these investors can do. I think there's just a real limit in the nature of the problem. And if you want to say, we have to keep it in the ground, you're not going to get that through a ship of the <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's sort of, that's a big set of limits. I mean, that's sort of the context of all of this. So we have a, just less than 10 minutes left, so maybe we can do a final round of uh, questions that, that are remaining up there. Uh, so Graham Ald from Carleton University. Um, I just had two questions. The first, it kind of builds off this this question of um, the more the dynamic effects of these um, of these uh, strategies. And so I'm thinking of some of the work in uh, social movement studies that looked at uh, companies that acquiesce to certain demands at what time one uh, that changes the corporate opportunity structure such that at time two they're more amenable to certain additional activist pressures. Um, so I'm wondering in your own, you, you mentioned a couple of companies that had been uh, targeted more than once, like ExxonMobil. Um, is, is that something you're trying to ta uh, tackle? Is this sort of dynamic effects of mobilization that the, the attempt to stonewall at first leads to a different response at time two, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and wh how that, wh what that means for how the activists think about these tactics. And then the second one is, obviously these tactics are not uh, in a vacuum. They're operating alongside all these other activist um, initiatives like divestment campaigns and, uh, and other direct action tactics. So I'm wondering if you th thought about some work in sort of organizational sociology talks about when you have um, fragmented uh, um, demands from different constituencies, that that essentially gives the corporate actor an opportunity to pick and choose which which kinds of demands do they want to ac ac acquiesce to and which ones can they ignore because they'll pick the ones that are easiest and then they can say, we've done something. Um, so that's the kind of a negative interaction between tactics. And I imagine there's probably positive interaction. But I'm just wondering, in, in the broader project, are you thinking about how, re how resolutions as one very specific type of intervention from these movements interacts with place-based initiatives, other types of campaigns, and with what effect, right, for the for the caribou. Yeah. Yeah. And is there, are there any other questions, uh, final questions, for Kate before we make, can, can I throw one in? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a fairly straightforward one, but I, I was a bit struck by the the non-binding. Uh, quality of the, these re uh, resolutions, from what I understood, and, and wondering how that affects the sort of the strategic calculus of various actors involved, particularly uh, shareholders who are voting in favor. And it, it, it makes me wonder, I mean, what's to stop someone from voting in favor sort of as a, uh, a, a way of uh, sort of compelling or suggesting that they're, they're, they're interested in this measure in an ideational sense, but we know it's not. Keep so it's, it's like our way of sort of saying, yeah, we care about this, you know, we care about this, in, this initiative, but we know ultimately <laughs> it's, it's not going to go forward. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll start with that and then turn to Graham's questions. Um, in part because I think the resolutions themselves are maybe not the best example, but those climate commitments made by BlackRock and Vanguard very publicly, so those big financial management firms, you know, massive trillions of dollars of investments that they hold, made climate commitments for guiding their investment decisions. And they've been under fire recently for essentially not having taken any action that actually underpins those commitments. So they've made these very public statements that, yes, climate risk is a financial risk, and we have to take this into account in our financial decisions and investments. And essentially, the critique is their behavior hasn't changed in the investment world. So is that an example of would be great in an ideal world, it's really hard to hold them to account even when they themselves have taken that on. I think that's that's a great example. They're not companies themselves that are the fossil fuel extractors. I mean, they're, they're fund managers, they are the investors, but it's a good example of these things so being really hard to actualize. Lots of companies, Exxon included, have come up with various disclosures, public disclosures of climate risks or in hydraulic fracturing, some 
elements of, of risk disclosure around fracking operations that they put in their annual general reports. How much that is an easy win for a company to say, yes, we're paying attention, even if the vote didn't hit that 50%. What that means for an individual investor deciding to vote for or against, I'm not sure. Um, they're not very public votes. So you're not saying much publicly with a vote yes or no. What we get is these aggregate kind of vote shares. I don't think that we have the ability, I haven't looked at these data, but I don't think we have the ability to see which shareholder voted yes or no. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure there would be much other than maybe personal satisfaction yeah. won by a shareholder Always. voting yes for something they don't think is going to happen. Um, certainly not a public reason. So you wouldn't look like a better person to others because they have no idea if you're part of that 30% or 24%. So I, yeah, I mean, I do think the non-binding nature gives some wiggle room, but I think it's one of the things that suggests that these have more significance than a vote share would suggest. So sort of that back and forth, how significant are they? But then again, how significant are they in a form where corporate behavior is fairly prescribed anyway? These are about how much they disclose in terms of risks to water, air, and soil. So we can think about that limitation. Um, so Graham, yes, so two things I guess on, maybe on the, the first, this idea of this iterative set of strategies. So corporations are receiving a shareholder demand, a request, a filing. If they're engaging with the shareholders and having it withdrawn ahead of time, then they're clearly making decisions about trying to stave off that vote. If shareholders, there's nothing that stops a shareholder from the next year saying, you didn't do what we thought you would, we're going to file something else. And so we suspect that that's what's happening in companies where there have been some skipped years, where otherwise they've been had filings multiple years. There's some rules within the SEC that say a vote has to acquire a certain vote share to be allowed to go on the ballot again. It's a 3-6-10 rule. So the first year, if, it, if a vote gets 3% of the vote share and then shareholders are allowed to put forward a similar resolution the next year. That year, they can only do it again if it gets at least 6%, mm -hmm. and the third year would have to get 10% again. Now, just about all of these uh, hit that threshold. All of them did. So 6%, they could have filed that the next year as well. This was in 2016, so we have so to extend. Don't we don't know, but um, Dominion, now Dominion didn't get targeted in 2013 or at least it didn't go to a vote, whether they, um, these are only the ones that went to a vote, so whether they were targeted, I have to look. But essentially, yes, there's an element of, of it seeming like there's an iterative strategy that shareholders think, if we push further, maybe this year they'll be more amenable. But we also see a change in language associated, so those model vote, or those model resolutions, the same resolution is not always put forward to a company, and it seemed to go in kind of sets. So it seemed that in the different years, and this isn't in this table, but in different years, more of the resolutions seem to be about similar themes. Um, and so it seemed to be almost a larger set of strategies than just an individual. There seemed to be something else going on. We didn't track that in this project, but it would be worth looking at is what other campaigns were happening that might suggest that this year there's a lot more about the social and community risks, and this year there's a lot more about metrics for evaluating risk. Um, we didn't look at that, but I suspect there's something going on. That kind of internal and external interplay seems really important. Um, the other piece is the board of directors votes do are relevant in this. So one of the strategies of climate activists has been to try to force companies to put directors on their boards who have climate expertise. And the I think the goal of that is once you have a board of directors where there's a voice on that board who says, hey, climate is concerning and important and relevant to our financial performance, then demands made by shareholders or outsiders are more likely to be taken seriously. So I do think that that is something that uh, resolution filers on fracking are paying attention to certainly the ones that are motivated by climate concerns. For the Environmental Health Network folks, those who are really concerned about water contamination, social and environmental health, I don't know how much their thoughts have been on changing boards of directors. 
but I could imagine that being a tactic moving forward. And I do, I mean, I think that interplay, that sense of, is a corporation shifting um, in the interest of actors who are both inside and outside of those corporations. So part of the reason that we want to look at that network dimension of socially responsible investing firms and their connections to non-governmental organizations is to try to unpack that a little bit. So I don't think from the data we have that I can say very much about those larger interplays, those larger kind of sociological aspects of movements, but this suggests there's something going on. And certainly the content of the model resolutions suggests to me that there's something that's happening outside. This paper was motivated in part because we expected when we went into the resolutions that we'd find most of them were about disclosure of the contents of the fracturing fluids. So the huge debate in the US around disclosures with fracking was about what was in the frack fluid. So what are they shooting down into our aquifers was the social question. Now, the actual mixing with drinking water aquifers of fracking seems to be pretty low. It's a very minor risk, according to most of the scientific research. Way more concerning is the surface water contamination, the spills. There's a little bit of evidence that some wells are leaking, but it's not as big a problem as surface water contamination. But it motivated a lot of the concern about what was being shot down. A lot of those mixes are trade secrets. So people don't know which chemicals are being mixed in. And that was, from an environmental health perspective, seen as very worrying. We expected that was going to be the focus of these resolutions from investors. And although it wasn't absent, it certainly wasn't the focus or it wasn't the exclusive focus. And so that sort of made us think twice about what is that relationship between the public discourse and what investors are demanding? Is that just a function of it's hard to make that a financial risk? Or is it a function of other social movement pressures being more influential in those campaigns? And I don't think I know. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was like, just right on that. Um, do you think asking about the chemical composition of the fracking fluid would break anti-collusion laws. So I'm trying to remember back, you know, pre-fracking days when I worked in air policy. If they couldn't in Canada, each facility, they couldn't say exactly what emissions they were releasing on a small time scale because that would give hints in terms of what technologies they were using, which then they couldn't share amongst other major corporations because that could lead to collusion or all of these things. Although I know that word means very different things now. Um, <laughs> So I'm wondering if maybe that was actually a much bigger ask. It's easier to do a carbon risk assessment or a methane risk assessment mm. than to perhaps really tip your hand to what technologies you're using by giving up the chemical mixtures that you're using. Oh man, that's a great mm. analysis of that. I hadn't thought about why investors would in fact be less likely to demand that. Mm -hmm. That's a, yeah, that, that might, I haven't read anything about that. Yeah, and I'm not sure about American laws. Possible if I in Canada. I mean, my my read on it, as a as someone who sort of thinks about hydraulic fracturing and its problems, is that frac fluid disclosure actually isn't going to get us very far in dealing with most of the environmental health concerns. Most of the frac fluid that they put down stays down, and most of the water that they bring up is actually underground fossil water, and so the chemicals that are a concern from the produced water are actually very different than the chemicals that they put in. Now, hmm. those chemicals might be a problem underground, and we know very little about deep uh, rock bed chemistry, geology, et cetera, to be able to understand the impacts. But in terms of an environmental health risk, what water we're worried about on the surface, it's both what they spill going in and what they spill coming out. Um, so I'm not sure if rack fluid disclosure actually is the thing that would be the most useful to push for anyway, but I hadn't thought about why investors wouldn't in quite those terms. That's a good yeah, and worth looking into. Just, just a little piece of information. I, I'm not aware of fracking, but in the mining industry, and I'm trying to remember, I was looking for the info, but I can't find it. It's either in Mexico or in Latin America that the main factor for uh, financial risk was uh, directly related to socio-environmental conflicts in the communities. And what is fascinating, what's happening in Mexico right now is that indeed, like every mining extractive companies or projects are very much taking that into account because of so many communities that have been saying, 
no mining, no extractive industries in our community, and they've been linking up in between the different uh, communities. So it's far from easy, and you know it's not a success story at all, but it's still quite meaningful in the sense that some investors have been saying, okay, let's get out of there, it's not going to go through anyway, and we're going to get into major trouble and violence and blah, blah, blah. So, so I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting to see this side of the story plus what's going on on the ground, and it seems that indeed it could be, you know, different strategies that are working together to where we see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly when you see the proliferation of bans and moratoria, mm -hmm. not just at country or province state territory levels, but municipal, local communities, yeah. like municipal bylaws that limit well drilling and spacing, <coughs> things like that. I mean, it, it certainly says there are social risks associated with the regulatory dimension that are very different than most companies are taking into account. Yeah, that's really So we're, we're <laughs> sort of out of time, but maybe you can uh, join me in, in one final yep. thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you to everyone for, for making it out today. There are still plenty of sandwiches, so grab one on the way out.